Welcome to a ride on the outside. MMA is full of people on the inside, but what about the ones that watch from beyond? Welcome to the MMA Outsiders with Tom Albano and Zan Bando on the Empty the Bench Podcast Network. Welcome to another edition of the MMA Outsiders. That's Zan Bando. I'm Tom Albano. We are here for episode number 15. Zan, we are in the middle of a couple big fight weeks here. This is the big transition week. We go from one big card at Madison Square Garden. We go from my hometown to your hometown. Big Bellator card this weekend, Bellator 288. Uh, now, Zan, I'm going to be very nice to you because you are going to be getting a lot of content there, and I'm very excited for you. And I can't wait. MMA Outsiders is going to be at Bellator 288 Live. This is going to be phenomenal. However, I must uh, ask you, Zan, so you think I'm insane? You said it was. I was absolutely out of my mind for even thinking Alex Pereira had a shot at capturing the middleweight title. <laughs> and, well... Sometimes these things happen in MMA. Yeah, um, I gotta take this one on the chin. I gotta say that I was wrong, but I gotta say going in, going into the fifth round, I was feeling pretty good that I would sweep the main card on predictions, and then all of a sudden, whatever Alex Burr's corner told him apparently worked. It worked really well, and uh, in the most emphatic fashion that anyone's ever seen, at least in my recent memory, um, the, the 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 finishable. Of finishes did occur, but before we get deeper into um, UFC 281 and what was, be sure to like and subscribe. Be sure to follow us all across social media at MMA Outsiders ETV. All of that stuff is going to scroll across the screen in here for a little bit. And then, of course, be sure to uh, subscribe and ring the notification bell. That way, you don't miss anything related to Empty the Bench or Empty the Bench's content as well. Of course, you can follow me at Zambando99. You can follow Tom at Thomas J. Albano, but yeah, um, I get it. I get it. And I did take this one on the chin. And of course, if you like, if you like reading more about chins as well, you can read, <laughs> you can read Tom's work at Fanside and MMA. You can read all of my work, work at BJAPEN.com, where I'll be pumping out as much Bellator content as possible this week. So very excited to get deeper into the show. And yeah, I'll be the first to admit to you that, yeah, I, I was entirely wrong on this one. Although for like 20 minutes of that fight, I was I was looking like an expert. And apparently the outcome shows that I'm simply not an MMA expert just yet. And honestly, I don't really think any of us are because the, the, that's the that's the sport. Something the sport doesn't happen. make any sense, Dan. The sport doesn't make any sense. No, no, but you know what? No, that it just doesn't. proves something. It just proves something. We're not insiders. But we are outsiders. That's that's very that's very true. We are we <laughs> we are we are outsiders, but we do not we do not claim we do not claim to be insiders with inside information, quote unquote. unquote. Um, but yeah, that that knockout was absolutely insane. And I mean, you have to give all the credit in the world to Pereira for you know believing in his corner and not giving up and anything like that. Also. You got to kind of fault Izzy a little bit. If you noticed, like near the fourth round and at the beginning of the fifth, he was kind of stagnant, kind of sitting back and waiting a little bit. And he may have gotten a little bit too overconfident. And he got caught. And, you know, sometimes those things happen. But I have to ask you this question going into the fifth round. Um, did you have it uh, scored three to one for Adesanya? Because that's yes, how I, I had it. Yes, I did. I gave. I gave Pereira the second round just because he seemed to, you know, he controlled Izzy throughout that second round. But the first round I had for Izzy, especially after the late combination that stunned Pereira, and I have to give Pereira credit for coming back in that second round and fighting very skillfully. Um, but then you just saw Izzy just, throughout the first 20-something minutes, Izzy was just very patient with his shots. He was, I have to give you credit, very tactical with what he was doing. That he wasn't, you know, I thought for a mistake, maybe it was a mistake to stand and trade, but 
he wasn't trading. What he was doing was he was picking his shots and then just finding a way to get around uh, Pereira's, get around Pereira's, well, muscles, get around Pereira, basically his attack. Kind of reminded me, Zan, I'd say, I, I think this might be a little stretch of a comparison, but maybe appropriate considering he has a big fight coming up in a month, uh, less than a month. Reminded me of the point fighting style of Stephen Wonder Boy Thompson, in which he would get in there, get his shots, and then get around, trying to avoid Pereira. Basic, basically trying to get Pereira to come to him, but being, you know, being elusive enough to avoid all of Pereira's power. I'm sorry, Tom, but that is a terrible comparison. And all and I'll explain because Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, it would be it would be different to say this if Stephen Wonderboy Thompson actually won any of his ultimate title fights. He did he didn't. I would say it was more so of the 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 style that you're describing reminded me more so of um a la Shogun versus Machida too, or Machida versus Evans, something where you know, you have to wait for one guy to come to the other. And if you recall those fights, um, as well as I'm remembering them, that's exactly what happened. Okay, correct. But for a while, it looked like Izzy was actually getting the better of him. Izzy being patient and Izzy being very tactical was getting the better. But of course, all Pereira needed was one shot. And I kind of alluded that all he needed was one shot. And I, I think uh, they kind of put it best on the post-fight show uh, for ESPN Plus with Dustin uh, Poirier and with uh, Teddy Atlas. Is he needed to fight a full 25 minutes? He needed to fight a perfect 25 minutes. He and fought a perfect. Exactly, he fought a perfect 21 minutes. That's exactly what the broadcast said at the beginning of the pay-per-view. Did they not? He did, and point proven. Once once he let Pereira, as you kind of mentioned. Once he let off the gas a little and let Pereira get to him in that fifth round, it was over. My question, Zan, were you okay with the finish? Were you okay with the stoppage? No, I was not. Really? And I'll, and I'll, and I'll explain. Oh, I did some research after this loss, and I went back into the archives, and I recalled a fight from a couple years ago, Israel Adesanya versus Kelvin Gastelum, very similar scenario, Okay. Open gas to him, nearly putting Israel Adesanya out on his feet. And guess who the referee is for that fight? You guessed it, Mark Goddard. And Mark Goddard did not stop that fight. Obviously, as you know, the rest is history. Adesanya goes on to win that fight. He goes on to beat Robert Whitaker and become the champion. To not give, in my opinion, this is on the fault of Goddard. To not give the champion the respect that he deserves to go out on his shield like that, in, in my opinion, was 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 criminal and I do, and I do think that that stoppage was way too early. I don't know if I would say way too early. I think we've seen much worse stoppages in MMA, and I think as of late, we've had maybe an issue or two as of late in which a fight gets stopped, you know, too late. But so I want to give credit yeah. to where God. I want to give credit to, you know, I was like, I shouldn't say credit, but I didn't have as bad of a problem with the stoppage in the moment in the moment i didn't think there was an issue afterwards where i was seeing izzy you know it, it landing on his a couple of shots landing on izzy's arms like the last three or so maybe four landed on izzy's mm -hmm. arms i can understand but i also think zan i don't think izzy did a good enough job of responding well either no, he was not throwing as many counter shots as as you would have hoped. Um, I'll give you, I'll give you that. But I do think, you know, to give him the respect to like let him, let him go down. In my opinion, to show like, yeah, you fully, you fully knocked him out. I think would have been a little bit more of a would have been a little bit more of a fight sensical, if you will, a more of a fight sense. And you do, I just, I just think to give the champion a chance to to say that I'm out. Um, would have, I think, been the right thing to do, just considering, you know, his run to this point and everything. Um, but I have to ask, with how stunning of a comeback it was, when Pereira actually won, and as you were as you were watching it unfold, uh, what was your what was your first reaction when he actually won? 
So I thought, you know, I thought for like a few seconds before Izzy got officially stopped, I thought Goddard was going to step in. Uh, and then Goddard eventually ended up stopping, stepping in. I'm just thinking to myself, wow. But wow on the perspective of, I called it last week. And then wow on the perspective of, I, I kind of like kind of like what MMA Twitter has been saying the last 48 hours. Just picture this, Zen. Imagine you're talented in one area of life, but there's somebody who's better than you, and they get the better of you multiple times. So you decide to go into another discipline, another area of life, and you succeed, and you're probably, you know, you get all the high praise, and you're considered one of the greatest of that sport. And then that rival follows you over to that sport and beats you when it's the top. It's like, it's a ghost. Izzy just can't get away from Pereira. No, he can't. Um, I got to say this, Tom, and obviously we weren't is so in, in case you guys are curious what, what I'm about, what I'm about to say is not officials or don't go say, Oh yeah, this is according to the MMA. There's none, none of, none of what I'm about oh, to say is of, this is all hypothetical. Could you imagine if the UFC puts this rematch in in Brazil in like April or May? Like I just I, I think if they if they put this in Pereira's backyard, I really don't see how he, he loses a rematch with this home country behind him. Do you? Because I certainly don't. I would not put it past the UFC. I mean, think about it, Zen. The fact that it only took Pereira eight. MMA fights, four within the octagon to capture the UFC middleweight championship. The last time we saw somebody with that fast of a pace, Zan, from now granted, not in terms of years, because he, he had four MMA fights before he even got to the UFC. He had a few of his MMA fights during his kickboxing days, but just the fact that it was only eight fights and you know, only four of four or five of them were in recent times. I mean, yeah, Zan, I mean, the, you were thinking I mean, the fastest run ever, I think I know where we're going with this, is probably Brock Lesnar, right? I would say the fastest since we've seen Brock Lesnar go from his first fight in like 06 or 07 to winning, to beating Randy Couture in November of 08 for the UFC. And how, and how, ironic, how ironic is this that, uh, that this episode is currently coming out on the anniversary of UFC 91, which happened to be November 15, 2008. Time is a full circle, Zan. Is, is that is that weird? <laughs> Time is, that is a weird? full circle. Um, I know. Also, I know in terms of the record that you know some people would make. You know, their first UFC appearance at the tournament shows, and they would win a tournament title. Anderson Silva was only in his second UFC fight when he won the middleweight title. But those are you know either the tournament shows, the old old days, or the days in which, you know, like Anderson Silva, Anderson Silva had a long MMA track where he fought in like pride and Brazil and throughout Brazil before he got to the UFC Pereira, you know, kickboxing is one sport. MMA is a completely other sport. True. And um, I know we're, I know we're looking down the road, but it's going to be interesting to see when Pereira fights a wrestler, how is he going to do against a style he's never seen before? I'm, and I guess Sean Strickland counts, but I'm talking like a real legitimate, like high level, you know, a wrestler that could really do some damage. It's no disrespect to Sean Strickland, but if oh, no, what, Sean, to... what Sean Strickland did, Zan, was stupid. Sean Strickland could have had a different outcome if he actually fought that fight intelligently. No, no, no of course. My overall point is, though, is if Pereira keeps the title, he has a nasty list of fighters to get through if he wants to even think about keeping the title for as long as he hopes to. Oh, I mean, uh, did you see Rob Whitaker's reaction? Because Rob Whitaker, when he, he did like uh, one of those watch alongs and he had his reaction, I mean, part of it was like shock, like all of us. And then I could see maybe a twinkle in his eye and it's like, Oh my God, my window just reopened. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hey, sign me up for Whitaker Pereira. Sign me up for that fight, wherever, wherever the fuck it is. Put it in, put it, put, put it in Chicago if you want. I wanna, I wanna see it. I wanna see, I wanna see that fight. 
But as far as what you said before about Pereira going into Pereira's backyard in April or May, maybe even June, and taking on Izzy in a rematch there, I would not put it past the UFC. They seem to you. We kind of hinted at it last week. They seem to be all aboard this Pereira hype train, and I think they would they would run this back just to just to torture Izzy some more and make Pereira four and zero against him in competitions. Oh, I mean, this literally feels to me like. It's their new love affair with Conor McGregor, who's not Conor McGregor. That's how it. That's how it feels to me. Like it's slowly going towards that. Like they, like they love him so much that they'll basically do whatever, whatever they, whatever they please with them. I mean, <laughs> that's what it. That's what it seems like to me. I mean, we'll talk about uh, fellow Irish fighters and in, uh, in Molly the Ken and the devastating loss that she suffered in just a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, shock and Zan, think about it. It was less than three months ago. We were sitting here talking about Leon Edwards pulling off a last round, literal last minute finish when he looked pretty much done against Kamara Usman. And now it, the same happens to it to Alex in Alex Ferrer versus Israel Adesanya. How nuts it is to have those two similar kinds of finishes just a few months apart from one another. Yeah, not only that, uh, you know, when it joins a list of, you know, some of the most legendary comebacks ever, and it's definitely right up there, um, if not um, supersedes Silver versus Sun in one. And I would, and I would argue that it actually does. What do you, what do you, what do you think? You really think it does? Because I could have sworn you said that it didn't supersede that Edwards versus Usman didn't supersede. Silver yeah, summer. this one this one feels way different though, in, in my in my opinion, is because um if you watch both fights, although Silva did get taken down in the fifth round, you could just tell the whole round he was trying to go for the finish, trying to set something up, and I feel like Pereira did the exact same thing in the fifth round. So I think in their own unique ways, both fights, although twelve years apart, are very similar. So. That's a fair point. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd probably still lean to the Silva Sudden just because of how... Maybe it's because the legendary status on this fight has not set in yet. No. Maybe we, we got to see maybe down the line. But right now, I'm still leaning towards the Silva Sudden finish. I mean, maybe one day the Edwards Usman one will be... Will have uh, will supersede depending on the legacy of that fight. Obviously, that fight's still in some major negotiations for for the springtime in uh in London. Oh, so. for sure. I don't think there's a shadow of a doubt though, Tom, in terms of Edwards Usman, where there's no way that you can't tell me that Edwards Usman is easily the craziest welterweight title fight finish you've ever you've ever seen. It has to in in my opinion, I don't know if you feel the same way, but it has to be. Could you repeat that? Oh, I was just saying there's no way that you can't tell me that Edwards Usman one, I guess we're calling it, is the is is the craziest um, Walter Waite title fight finish we've ever seen because to me it definitely is. Oh, it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and I just think it's interesting that not only do these two finishes happen uh, three months apart, um, but you know it also happens in the same year, which is pretty crazy usually you see one of these crazy fights a year mm -hmm. but well i guess you could say this is the third stunning fifth round comeback like finish considering we had yuri versus glover one in june that's true we, too so now we've had three insane fifth round finishes in the span of not very long which is pretty crazy to think about as well i, I mean i wouldn't uh, you know take uh, as crazy of a finish as this one is and as edward Usman was in August. I wouldn't put either of those, either of these above Glover versus Yuri because Glover oh, versus Yuri so far is my is my fight of the year pick. Oh, for sure, and that was almost like a near buzzer beater type of win, anyway. Which is the which is the most absurd thing about it. So, for yeah. sure. But I there's definitely going to be some sort of rematch between the controversy of, was it an early stoppage? Is he actually commenting that he had a problem at first, but didn't have a problem. And now actually having a recent comment that he's out for revenge, just the story of Alex Pereira and his quick path to the UFC title. 
their the UFC's love for Oxford, I there's definitely going to end up being a rematch. Tom, in, ima- Tom, imagine if they do this fight in Cardiff in London on the same card as Edwards Usman too. <laughs> I think that would be great, but I don't think it would happen because the UFC tends to go by weight class when it comes to the main event, and they're not going to put this fight over uh, Leon and, and Usman. No, that's fair, but one can only dream for a crazy international curve, right? <laughs> I know, I know. That would that would be amazing. I, I, uh, I, under, I understand you being a little bit more realistic, Oh, so it makes sense. It'll be moved to a different card. Oh, I know. Oh, no, no, Zen, Zen, Zen. You, just because I'm realistic doesn't mean I don't want it to happen. I'm no, just, no, no. this is the UFC now. It's just, it's, it's, it's the UFC and Dana being how they are. We can't have this crazy thing where the middleweight title is the co main event, but the welterweight title is the light, is the main event, even no, though. That, no, that, no, that, that's true. But the right. last time I think we've ever seen anything like that, because UFC 205, the first time they went to the Garden was like that, but that was because of you know who, right? He right. he he who shall not be named, right? Because people watching this podcast should 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 know us by now that when we refer to he shall not be named, there are very few names that we refer to, and one of them is the Golden Goose, if you will. So <laughs> the yeah. golden goose, the, I think all we need to say is the golden goose. And we know, you know who we're talking about. That's, that's true. But yeah, another, another crazy UFC main event. And I don't know if you saw this going in, but going into the main card, Tom, I think the UFC set a record and you can correct me. Remember, but I think there were seven first round finishes going in or seven um, finishes. I think it was seven or eight, seven or eight total first round finishes, which is a UFC record. Which is which is just absolutely amazing. <laughs> I mean, they love the finish. Hey, Dana, Dana loves the finish. That's true. And um, would you – okay, so now that MSG has had some legendary cards, is this the greatest MSG card of all time? Let's or see. is it still or is it still UFC 217? Okay, well let me let me try the thing. So number five at the very bottom is UFC 230, without a doubt. Uh, agreed. Four. You know what's funny? I, I'm trying to rank them in my head. UFC 230 in 2018 is the only MSG stinker. Like the other cards have been so freaking good. I'd say number four is uh, is UFC 244. 244, really? Mm-hmm. Maybe maybe because I was part of that fight week, it holds a different place in my heart. You know what I mean? Yeah, I hear you. So I'd say I. So maybe it is four, but it's not a bad four to me. It's Agreed. just four yeah, out agreed. of agreed. Um, like I said, the only stinker was 230. Three, maybe 205. Yeah, and then I'd say number two is this one, and number one is 270. Yeah, I, I think this one topped 205. This one definitely topped 205. I think 205 is always going to be somewhere in there, at least as of now, because there's only been five MSG cards. Uh, it, that, you know, because of the historical context to everything, that it was the very first MSG card for the UFC. And it's then. Yeah. It just, I was trying to think about it because I did actually an ETB minute on this as well as a moment of mayhem on this because there wasn't really too many sports stories going on on Saturday. So I was trying to think of a way to put it for the general sports can, uh, general sports audience. And Zan, I'm just thinking about it. Whenever the UFC seems to go to Madison Square Garden, just there is this magical feeling. Some sort of garden magic goes over the UFC. That it causes such a, you know, a big show. It just, the star power, the amount of finishes, any highlight kind of finishes. There is also a doofus kind of moment every time the UFC seems to go to New York. For Uh, sure. In our case, the doofus moments being the judge uh, score, not being able to do math and scoring it uh, a wrong way and not being able to grab the card until Bruce Buffer got it and fixing the mistake inside of the octagon. Which yeah, was, yeah. Dana White said that he had never seen anything like that. 
I have never in my life seen anything like that. That just made me absolutely facepalm. Like, really? I, I think, Zan, we need MMA judges to display that they know at least third grade math before they can be judges. Agreed. I was going to say, you were talking about the buzz and uh, it being super palpable when the UFC goes to MSG. I would compare an MSG UFC card to a college football upset. For sure. Oh, it is, oh, it's how it feels. It feels like every single big fight at MSG on the main card is like another version of a college football upset. Like if you like, like it feels like you flip on the TV, you go to ABC, there's one upset. You go to ESP, and there's another upset. And you finally, and then you finally go over to Fox, and there's a final. There's a final upset of the day. That's how it's just. It's just also. It's just also, um, you know, just the atmosphere of the crowd. Just the fact that they're buzzing. Like, as much as the arena wasn't exactly filled for um, the prelims, you could just feel the intensity even from the very first prelim, very, the very first finish of the show, that this was going to be a hot crowd. And this was a, this was a pretty hot crowd. For sure. With, um, with the amount of success that this card uh, had are you are you like counting the days until the next time that you can that you can go cover an event um yeah an msg and are you waiting for the day that you can finally go to your first ufc event in person for sure i'm just counting down to the next ufc msg card which is probably going to be yeah let me get my calendar up let me fit let me advance all the way to november of 2023 so be like UFC 291 or 292. Something, something like, like that. that. Um, so there's a so the Saturdays of November 2023 are the 4th, the 11th, the 18th, the 25th. I don't think the UFC would hold a card on Veterans Day, so I would assume it would be November 4th. I would I would agree with that. I mean, I could see them holding a card on Veterans Day, but a fight night kind of card. I don't see them going to Madison Square Garden for a big Card or I can see them doing it November 18th and rearranging the schedule. Maybe. I, But I know they've done it first weekend of November too, so I could see the 4th. 4th or the 11th. For sure, for sure. Um, yeah, that, that November MSG card is, is a big one. It feels it's, to me... It's, a, it, it's probably the UFC's greatest tradition now. Uh, uh, next to International Fight Week. Right, which I've been lucky enough to attend one IFW sort of. It was like a, it was like a dumbed down version because it was before the world was normal. But the two sixty four fight week was absurd, even without the extra UFC X and Hall of Fame and all that. It was still a wild week. But I got to tell you, I think the UFC's greatest traditions to me are that March pay per view is always huge. The, the the first one that's always the that's always really big because sometimes they do two of them. The March card's big, the July card's big, the November card's big, and the December card is usually I would, And Zan, I would add uh, for two, for a couple of reasons. I would add February two one because usually it's an international card, and this time they're going back to Australia, and that's usually where they are. And number two, they usually try to do it Super Bowl weekend. Yeah, they do. They do. By the way, it, it really wants me. It really wants me to see them go back to their vintage Super Saturday cards in Las Vegas that they used to do. Those probably, oh, yeah. will never, those probably will never happen again. But those were those were always pretty big too. But only one, only one can dream, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, for sure. Oh, and then I guess you could see the January card is usually pretty big because they usually try to do uh, Anaheim or Vegas or. And or one of those this year is obviously Rio, but yeah, January they usually try to stack it at the end of the month. So, as the first well, paper you for the gate. Well, also, thankfully, Dana mentioned at a you know, recent media appearance that the desire after after this year calendar year comes to an end, once 2023 hits, they're going to look to do more fight nights and such outside the outside the apex and go fully back to touring schedule. Which is a positive, but also kind of sad because it would be an RIP to the UFC fight night 
Apex era, which did deliver some pretty insane moments. I think uh, they'll still go to the Apex every now and again. Yeah, it, it won't be as consistent. It feels like the Apex has become the new Palms or Hard Rock Hotel and Casino for them. It seems, it seems like. So, True. I don't know. It's nice to see the UFC is looking more towards a normal schedule, which may mean that, uh, you know, who knows? They might hit all 50 states in the future. You never, you never know, but it's going to be an interesting year that if they do what they say they're going to do, um, especially with that new power slap fight league coming, <laughs> it's, going be, it's going to be a wild year for the company. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be ridiculous. Because think about it. You're going to have the ultimate fighter. You're going to have Dana White contender series. You're going to have eight to 10 episodes of power slap. And you're going to have pay-per-views and fight night cards. It's going to be, it's going to be absurd. There's going to literally be some sort of fight content every three days for the entire year. How much are you going to be watching that power slap league? I'll probably watch every episode to be honest with you. I, I'm kind of, I have this morbid curiosity because I like roll my eyes and I'm like, I, I could see I could see myself tuning in just because I want to see just the sheer ridiculousness of it. Yeah, I want to see the, I want to see the ridiculousness ridiculousness of it. I want to see Dana's reactions to it, and I want to get to see some of the characters too. I, I want to see full blown WWE style entrances for this. Well, knowing the UFC, that probably won't happen. Probably not. It's probably going to be a dumbed down version of the Ultimate Fighter minus the cage. That's probably. what I. That, that, that's that's what I'm getting at. But apparently, there's going to be a Power Slap Championship fight on pay per view, which I don't know how that's going to exactly work. But yeah, maybe to make it part of a UFC card as an extra. I don't know if I'm going to pay Zan. I don't know if I'm going to pay sixty nine ninety nine to watch slapping. Yeah, it may be an extra for sure, but yeah, if they start if they start charging money, it may, may, maybe this is a way to rebuild Fight Pass, and maybe they put all the power up cards exclusively on UFC Fight Pass and not ESPN Plus. So I don't, I don't, I don't know. Hey, I mean TBS has the rights to it's not ESPN, so maybe maybe you're onto something. No, that's true. Where you see the actual show on TBS and, the, and you see the events on Fight Pass, it could be very possible. By the way. Just considering that, um, you know, the UFC is so exclusive to ESPN. When they said that TBS was going to do it, I was pretty, uh, I was pretty surprised. Same. I, I, I was expecting it would be an ESPN Plus show. That's what I would think. But who knows? Maybe ESPN simply didn't want it. So maybe not. Yeah. All right. Uh, we got more UFC 281. We got to talk about Zen. Not one, but two. Two title changes on this night. Whaley Zhang submits Carlos Farza pretty early in the second round, as I kinda as I kinda thought. New UFC women's strawweight champion. So what is this now? Is this now Whaley's now the third two-time champion in this division's history? Yes. Carla. Carla's a two-time champ. Rose is a two-time champ. And Whaley would be because Whaley beat Jessica Andraj. Right to originally, win, to originally win the belt. So yes, so, so Joanna, Joanna, and Andrade are the only ones to not be two time champs. Yes, and, and and that's because Joanna also held the belt forever. What felt like forever, but that right. was only nearly three years. Uh, my point, though, uh, I mean, Zen. I don't want to take any. I don't want to give any offense to Carlos Sparza, but combined the boring way in which and uneventful way in which she won the championship plus the fact that Whaley Zhang still looks strong controversial fight last year at MSG against Rose where she could have had her hand raised and then sending Joanna into retirement with the knockout this one seemed pretty elementary to me that Whaley was going to get the belt back here yeah but this is where I'm getting this is where I get confused because now is it just going to turn into a game of hot potato where you know you know, Whaley's next fight is going to be against Rose again, and then Rose is going to somehow win the title, and then they're going to have to do some sort of immediate rematch again with those two. It's like the whole women's strawly division to me is becoming a circus. Well, I mean, Zan, there is another idea which I kind of, we kind of talked about last week. There is somebody who just got a major win last week and upset in the women's strawweight division, talking about Amanda Lemos. 
That's true. Um, but I'm sorry, Tom, as much as I want to see that fight, the UFC is going to look at where it makes the most sense pay-per-view-wise. And, and they're going to they're go with the trilogy. They're going to go with the Rose uh, Whaley trilogy. Of course. And then who knows what happens, and then maybe the rest of the strawberry division just gets held up because that's the way it's going to be because they know where the uh, money wise or something like that. But, but I do think, I do think it would be a good scouting report for Amanda to see that fight because both girls have been champions before. She'll be able to see their tendencies and it should mm -hmm. be pretty entertaining too. So yeah, absolutely. As long as it's better than, uh, then the then the second fight, I think we're I think we're solid. So speaking of speaking of, then what do you do with Carla next? Do you want to give if you're will are you willing to risk Amanda Lemos and test her with Carla? Do you think maybe with since Carla's coming off of a loss and Marina had a big loss last week, maybe you pair the two of them together for their next fight? That that's what I was thinking. The latter of the two, Rodriguez is versus Esparza. If I if I were if I were one of the two matchmakers, that's what I would that's what I would do. This frame seems pretty simple enough. The only thing about Rose, I mean, yes, she technically is still the number one contender, but you know, she there was a while in which she hadn't fought. And it feels like she's fought nothing in but title fights. And I don't know. Are we really, you know, like, obviously it's probably going to be Whaley Rose 3, considering the trilogy, considering Whaley's champ, considering Rose beat Whaley twice on the record. Uh, I just don't know, Zan. I mean, after that horrendous fight with Carla in, in, in uh, what was it, in May? I, I, I really just, you know... I don't know if I'm motivated enough to see a Rose Whaley three as, as good as that second fight was. And as much of a big knockout we had in the first fight. Um, yeah. unless, unless maybe just Whaley just makes a better fight for Rose than Carla does. Which I think she would. Because I'd say maybe, maybe it's more about, maybe it's more about Carla's fighting style than Rose's uh, fights. I would agree with that. Um, I also would want to say, too, I don't think Carla, and I hate to say it, I don't think Carla gets another title shot again. I mean, could so, you imagine? she her, her UFC history is two title reigns both times she loses in the first defense. It, it's possible. It's, it's very realistic. Yeah, and I just, she's a great fighter. I just don't think her fighting style is enough to get me excited. I did to even watch a title run. Don't get me wrong. I mean, her, the way in which she pulled off upsets and managed to, you know, take by surprise when she became the women's strawweight champion, Ultimate Fighter season 20, phenomenal. But there was always somebody better. Joanna in uh, 2014, 2015. Here, Whaley Zhang, maybe even Rose Namajunas, depending on how you feel about that second fight. Yeah, which I actually think in the that second fight, I still think the judges got it wrong, but that's just me, though. I mean, I, it's tough to even consider who would really be the winner. Like, I like yeah. I feel like I feel like it was a, a default kind of move. It's like, okay, maybe Carla had more action, so Carla. It felt like the judges were just, you know, okay, this fight wasn't exactly good. So here's what we're going to do, judges. We're going to take this target here, okay? We're going to take a target. We're going to place it right here. We're going to blindfold you. Half of the half of the bullseye <laughs> is Carla. Half of the bullseye is uh, Rose. We just want you to just, you know. <laughs> because we, because Whaley's going to get the belt back anyway. Circle who you think won. And it doesn't matter who you think won. Because it, it won't matter in the next fight. So just circle who you think won. Uh, speaking of fights that actually did matter, however, Zan, uh, I think this <laughs> fight lived up to the hype, don't you? Oh, yeah. But first off, if you would have told me that Dustin Poirier would submit Michael Chandler, I think I would have laughed you off of the screen. <laughs> I was thinking it was going to be a knockout than a, than a submission. Yeah, apparently if you had Dustin Poirier by submission, it 
plus 650, you won a decent amount of won a decent amount of money Saturday night. So anybody anybody who had that ticket, congratulations. But uh tell me about your retirement plans out there. Yeah, no kidding. Um <laughs> But yeah, that fight, as is every Michael Chandler fight, <laughs> is one of the craziest fights you've ever seen. I mean, how how did the UFC manage to pick up both Michael Chandler and Justin Gaethje over the last few years and just have constant absurd, bangers with absurd. them? And they're all and it's all like a round robin of the fighting everybody. It's absolutely amazing. Um, and, and you know what's even crazier? Because Islam beat Oliveira, now everything's new again. Everything, you know, all the opportunities, all the windows are reopened now. True. Um, Tom, you've seen a lot of first rounds in your MMA watching career, so to speak. Is that one of the craziest first rounds you've ever seen? <laughs> definitely one of the definitely one of the craziest. Where, you know, it seemed like to be this constant back and forth battle with, but then, you know, like Chandler rocks him early. Poirier rocks him before, you know, before the horn. It looks like maybe for, you know, uh, Chandler takes control in the second round, uses his wrestling. And then I just, Zan, I'm sorry, but the finish of that, Chandler picking Poirier up, going to slam him. And Poirier rolls through, gets to Chandler's back, takes the back, and submits him with a rear naked choke in two minutes of the last round. No. Not just rolls him over, but if you watch that slam again, did you notice that Chandler went the wrong way? Which is why, which which is why that happened in the first place. Yeah, that's how uh, I think it was DC pointing out that he slammed him the incorrect way, and he left an opening for Poirier to uh, take advantage. Yeah, not not similar, but similar, but not similar. Very very uh, reminiscent of Hughes versus Trigg uh, too. I. As you could say, because Frank Trigg nearly submitted Matt Hughes, and and Matt Hughes picked him up, and him across the cage, slammed him, and Rene could show him on the other side. This wasn't really like that, but but it, but in a similar vein, there was a slam involved, and that's what occurred. Hey, that's Dana White's favorite fight. So very true. I still, I still think to this day, fifteen years later, he still admits that that's his favorite fight. <laughs> oh, it, I know he does. Uh, Michael Chandler said in the post fight press conference, so he thinks he's Dana White's favorite fighter. <laughs> yeah, um, if 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 Michael Chandler fighting Dustin Poirier um, isn't isn't Dana White privilege after coming off the losses that he's had, and after coming off a win against um, a Tony Ferguson who's on his way out, then I don't know. Then I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. I think this one lived up to the hype. I think this one deserved the uh, Fight of the Night Award, so as we expected. About, so how about this to play a little matchmaker? Dustin Poirier versus Ch Charles Oliveira 2. Winner gets Islam in a, in a potential mega fight um, when, when, when Islam's done fighting Volkanovski. Well, here's my question. How, what do you picture happening to the lightweight division if come February, and we'll get into this, Volkanovsky beats uh, Makachev? Oh, what would you, what would you do then? Is that your, is that your question? Yeah. I would say you'd have to do an interim title. And I don't think the UFC would have a choice. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it would just get absolutely nuts. We would see a complete complete shakeup on the uh on the ufc front uh when it comes to that lightweight division uh but yeah certainly lived up to the hype uh you ready to go over just the rest of the news and notes for 281 yeah um i was gonna say um i was gonna say also before we get into the rest of the news and notes i'm gonna be grading this as an a minus how about you a minus I think card. I think this is an A or A minus card. This this one had the hype, lived up to the hype, and I would even say with the eight, eight seven or eight first round finishes, the new UFC record. I think you could even say it surpassed the hype. This was phenomenal. I don't know about you, but I'm gonna be. Uh, we're we're gonna get into this in mid December, obviously. But I'm already putting this event card of the my, year on my unofficial ballot for event for event of the year. 
uh, at least on the UFC perspective, because yes. you know, over at fan, at least you know, over at fan side of your days there, we divided it UFC and non UFC on yes. the UFC yeah. front. Absolute on the UFC front, absolutely. And I would even stretch to say overall, overall, even beating out the Bellators, the ones I think this was the fight, of, the fight card of the year so far. Solid, solid choice. All right, let's talk about some other news and notes from from the card before we wrap, wrap things up. Uh, Frankie Edgar, man, I think this was the appropriate time to go out. His chin yeah. just cannot hold up anymore. And Gutierrez, you know, really landed on that chin. It was a third third time in a row he suffers a vicious knockout. Yeah, and all three of them got nastier by the knockout, which is even scarier. Um, yeah, I mean, he went out on his shield. He's Frankie Edgar. He's been a legend of the sport for years. I remember watching his UFC debut in February of 2017. This guy's going to be a world champion. And sure enough, three years later, he beats he BJ was, and Abu yeah. Dhabi. Um, to this day, I still think he won both Benson Henderson fights. Uh, don't, uh, don't at me on that because you know you know it's true. Um, he, he, he did whether the... I just say so or not. And I just appreciated that Frank Yeager was willing to fight anyone and everyone. The fight that I wish we would have gotten, but we never did, was obviously the one that got away, Conor McGregor versus the man right. himself in 2015 for McGregor's first featherweight title defense. It would have been an absolutely entertaining war, but it never occurred. But overall, great career, fought a lot of amazing fighters all throughout the sport. And as Dana likes to say, fighting is a young man's game. And uh, Gutierrez, easily the biggest win of his career. Yeah, we could have had, uh, you reminded me, we could have had Edgar versus McGregor. But McGregor decided to say, give me your belt and just go go up his little bunt, uh, belt hunting uh, expedition. Uh, a, little, a little belt hunting expedition that failed, I might add. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Gutierrez, though, he definitely big win of his career. But Edgar, you know, I said when he was making his last entrance, I'm going to miss that jog to the octagon, that jog of uh, hype this, like, you know, where he didn't expend any of his energy. And like I mentioned uh, in, a, in a fan-sided piece, he helped innovate, you know, these light lighter uh, weight divisions. I mean, his upset of BJ Penn, the absolute war of a trilogy he had with Gray Maynard. The fact he went to featherweight. And then the only person, the, I mean, the actually only two people he lost to at featherweight. One was uh, T-City in 2018. But before he lost to T-City, the only person he had lost to at featherweight was Aldo, who was Un two title fights. Unbelievable. I mean, in that I mean that just goes to show that the level of competition that he fought was, you know, you know, stud after stud. And actually, he lost stud. to a third person. Actually, I remember he lost to a third person. That was Max Holloway, another one of the featherweight goats. Un unreal, unreal. I mean, he is, he's a legend. In my opinion, he's the greatest MMA fighter to ever come out of New Jersey, and I don't even think he's even close. No, absolutely. And he represented the tri-state area when, you know, you didn't have any fighters coming out of New York because, you know, for the longest time, New York and an MMA just were, uh-uh. Uh, Dan Hooker getting a win to kick off the main card. And Zan, I don't know if this was a Dan Hooker win or if this was a Claudio Puella's loss because his spirit just looked absolutely broken in that fight. Yeah, we were, we were dead wrong on this, weren't we? Um, originally, originally on the episode, but then obviously we decided to change our mind, and at least I took Hooker just. I took I, Hooker I, as well. I, I I just had a weird feeling that something bad was going to happen, and sure enough, it did. I would say this is a play as loss more than Hooker win. I I think, I mean, Puella is. I mean, come on, man. So he's just going for the constant in my role. You know what I was thinking, Zen, when that before that body kick came in. I was thinking, you know, we're on the road to another Nick Sarah style ending where he probably gets disqualified due to timidity. And it was just got a pure exhaustion. He spent all his energy on the grappling, spent all his energy trying to get Hooker in submissions and stuff. And it just didn't work. And he just, by the start of the second round, it just like, he was, he just looked, Zan. You could just look into his eyes like, okay, I'm done. 
Agreed. Agreed. And, um, you know, it's going to be one of those learning experiences, but for Hooker, it revitalizes his career. So he should be very, very proud of that. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how he bounces back in 2023 because that's a big win to close out what was a rough 2022 for the Hangman. So uh, just look at the rest of the, on the prelim side, though. Renato Moicano submitting Brad Riddell and then deciding to play The Rock in post fight promo, saying Moicano, referencing himself in the third person and just delivering. A post-fight interview back, if you were watching on ESPN Plus, was absolutely entertaining. And then if you were watching on ESPN News, was frustrating because they censored every other word. Yeah, I saw the unedited version and I could not stop laughing. I, I That is the most emotion I have ever seen out of that man. And, and I want more of it. I think you're speaking for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um. We were talking about this before we went on the air, Zen. I mean, Dominic Reyes. What a, just, what a fall! What a fall from grace, right? Something happened in that, you know. It's like ever since that John Jones loss, the controversy of that loss has just eaten away at him. That he's lost four straight now. To this day, I still think he beat John Jones three to two. I really, I, I really do. I I think so too. I still hold it that Dominic Reyes won that fight. But you know what? Judges didn't see that. And now I guess his reign wouldn't have less anyway because he lost to Jan, he lost to Yuri, and now he's lost to Ryan Spann. And all of them have just been brutal. <laughs> like literally brutal. Speaking of brutal, Molly McCann. What did he get once she get out struck like 140 something to zero? Absurd. I mean, hey, hey Aaron, Aaron, hey Aaron Blanchfield, to beat Molly McCann in front of Dave Portnoy and Dan Katz, <laughs> that's pretty. And 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 I and I know I have the I have the I back there I have to fix it, but that, that's like that's like the biggest like screw you <laughs> I've ever I've ever seen. That Aaron Blanchfield has made herself publicly public enemy number one at at, at a bar stool. Yeah, that was pretty. That was pretty epic to to see, wasn't it? And that was I, an easy. That was an easy pick too. Super easy pick. I mean, Zen. I guess the UFC has been, you know, dying, you know, <laughs> to find this Conor McGregor, you know, that this next person to take the uh, to take the helm. And so far, they've just have not found it. They try to get what they can. I mean, hopefully, Patty has some better luck next month. Could you imagine if he somehow not just beats Jared Gordon but dominates him? I don't. I don't see it at all. <laughs> and and Zen, I mean, it goes to show you. I think the UFC needs Conor McGregor more than Conor McGregor needs the <laughs> UFC at this rate. Agreed, agreed. And I think that Molly McCann fight showed that and a whole lot more. Uh, Andre Petrosky, one of the rare decisions on this card. Good performance against Wellington Terman. Yep. Matt Frivola. I mean, good lord. I, I jumped out of my seat when he knocked out Ottman. Yeah. Um, I honestly think that finish marks the end of Ottman's UFC run. What do you what do you think? I mean, we thought it was we thought it was gonna be the end of Ottman as I guitar when he uh, broke COVID protocols and had a bag snuck in <laughs> during Fight Island. But you know. Dana, I guess, just wanted the controversy to die down. Brought him back, and well, uh, here's the price you pay: the steamroller. Yeah, getting smoked by him. Uh Carolina Kowal, Kowal, it's, I mean, Zen, Carolina, you gotta feel somewhat good for. I mean, it wasn't the most exciting fight, but and we had the stupid controversy of the judging scorecard. But I mean, after losing for what four or five straight three in a three year span. Now she's won back to back fights. That's yeah, you know. it crazy. Isn't it crazy too that Carolina, her last name is actually Kovolkovich. I know you were, I know we were trying to, you were trying to find I, it. That, yeah. that is how, that, that is how you pronounce her last name. But, um, but, uh, you know what's interesting? Isn't it just so crazy that seven years ago she fought for the, she fought for a championship? Isn't yeah. it, isn't it just weird to you? I know. Doesn't feel that long ago. 
doesn't feel that long ago. Um, speaking of craziness on the prelims, uh, Zen, did you see the double knockdown with uh, Choi Sung Woo and uh, Michael Trezano? I sure did. That was absolutely epic. I, I was thinking, oh my god, could you imagine if we had a double knockout finish? We have never seen a double knockout finish in the UFC where both. No, of them- no but I have seen it. There's a video you can you can find it. It's like two million views. You've probably seen it, but but it's this one. It's this one amateur show. I don't know where it is. The the, the fight starts in the first punch that gets from both both guys get right out simultaneously. And the referee has no idea what to do. And uh, that was what that was what reminded me of that. The second that it happened, like, oh my god, that is shades of the viral YouTube video. Were, were, were the people watching it had no idea who the two fighters were and, and that and then that happened oh but there was a there was a video i saw of like uh oh are you talking about the one where i was trying to look at oh it was shawnee connor was the referee yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's exactly. and he just starts freaking out <laughs> yeah yeah that's, yeah that's the one <laughs> um Montel Jackson, big win over Julio Ars, and uh, Carlos Olberg. I mean, you wow. talk about cutting the night off right. Carlos Olberg wow. just we nailed, we nailed, we nailed that one. We knew that we knew, we we knew that that was going to happen easily. All right, so that was an epic UFC 281. Uh, a couple more notes just from the card. Obviously, we referenced it before, but it's official: Islam Makachev uh, versus. Uh, Islam Makachev will make his first defense of the UFC lightweight championship in a super fight against Alexander Volkanovsky, who goes from featherweight to lightweight in an attempt to become champ champ. With that, however, there's going to be a featherweight title, interim title fight between Yair Rodriguez and Josh Shemek. So, Zan, we talked about the Makachev Volkanovsky uh, scenario. We talked about how crazy it could ch- shake up the lightweight division. Let's focus on this co main event. Do you think it's necessary to have an interim championship in this bout? Yeah, I think so. Just because you don't know how you don't know how the lightweight championship will play out, and if Volkanovski upsets Makachev, we're gonna we're gonna call it an upset for now. I think it cancels each other out. So I think they're literally doing this interim title fight just in case something goes awry in the Makachev Volkan. Keep fight. So on the UFC's part, it's actually very smart in my opinion. I was actually thinking, I was saying originally, you know, hey, this is kind of stupid. Just name it a number one contenders fight. But then I thought about it, Zan. And, and not just a, you know, just in case something bad happens to Volkanovski and he can't compete for months. But I'm just thinking, if Volkanovski wins and then says, you know what? I've done all I can with the featherweight title. I'm just going to focus on lightweight. I guess it allows also for an easier transition that whoever's the interim champ can just be promoted. Like how, uh, you Ronda know, Rousey. what happened? Just like a Ronda Rousey was when they started the, uh, the bandwagon division. Right. Just like how Ronda Rousey was just like how Jose Aldo and Dominic Cruz were. I was going to go more than, you know, like the WBA promotes its regular champion to a super champion, but that's using a stupid boxing comparison. Yeah, quite frankly, it is. But it, <laughs> you know, you're gonna do, you're gonna do, you're gonna do what you're gonna do. Uh, the the comparison still counts. Well, I'll let it, I'll let it, I'll let it slide. But I was gonna say though, Josh Emmett is getting screwed here. What do you, what do you agree? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think this is a. I right now, if you ask me, you know, guns to the head, who I think is gonna win, I would say Yair Rodriguez. Um, <laughs> how do you feel? Zan, how do you feel about Arnold Allen not being selected for this uh, interim title fight? It's okay. Emmett, Emmett was more deserving anyway. Do you and, think? Uh, and also, even though Rodriguez won in the fashion that he did, he still beat Bra and Ortega. I would hold that win higher value than Arnold Allen knocking out Dan Hooker, in my opinion. Do you think then, Zan, they give Arnold Allen Max Holloway next? I could, I could easily see it. I, I think that might be the fight to make to my, probably make next if you're going to go in this direction, just because we haven't seen Holloway versus Allen, and 
really those are the only two guys who have left at this point because and then i guess you could call holly versus allen the unofficial interim 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 <laughs> right we did you fight right unless unless i don't know unless you're giving you know holloway the the korean zombies retirement fight no absolutely no they would never no they would never do that they don't want I, they don't want they don't want to see the korean zombie get mauled <laughs> on the feet uh, that's true. Uh, but I'm saying that it's either that or just, you know, cause like you mentioned, Ortega's out with injury because of how he finished against, uh, Rodriguez. Calvin Cater's out with injury. Giga Chikase's at number, I think it's number eight. Yeah. Number eight, Bryce Mitchell at number nine. Bryce Mitchell has a fight coming up and Giga Chikaze, I think still has a few ways to go before we talk about title picture with him. So it seems like they've set in stone these two matchups and then at some point you got to work in Holloway versus Allen. For sure. I, I could see Holloway versus Allen headlining a fight night card. Yeah, definitely. It will. It definitely will. Uh, Zen, before we get into anything else, there was also this BS that happened. So Nate Diaz got into MSG with a t- without a ticket. And Zan, what do we say? When the Diaz brothers get involved, you know some shit's going to go down. And, well, it went down. And who did it go down with? Dylan Danis. Zan, do you care at all about Dylan Danis? (laughs) Be honest with me. No, I mean, Tom, you you may or you may not. I won't judge if you do. But if you follow Dylan Danis on Instagram, every single post is, is, this guy's a coward. I'll be back. And then literally, and then literally three days later, it's the same thing. And every and every single comment is, you're irrelevant. When's the last time you fought? And Sam, I'm glad you mentioned that because I actually now have to look up when the last time Dylan Dan is has he fought since that Bellator card in 2019? No, he hasn't. No, so he hasn't fought in three years. He hasn't fought since that Bellator MSG card in 2019. He hasn't fought in three years. <laughs> three, we're going to three and a half years. He's pulling the GSP route. <laughs> I can't believe I I feel sick making a comparison between GSP and Dylan Danis. It's absurd, absolutely <laughs> absurd. But uh, hey, Dylan Danis is only way to stay relevant, is it not? <laughs> it's pathetic. I'll call it's it that. Pathetic. I mean. He should I just start. He should just start doing Instagram sponsored posts at this point. Because this, <laughs> is, this is getting. This is getting ridiculous. <laughs> He's an inf- oh, Dylan Dennis is an influencer, all right, but not oh, the kind sure. of influencer you think he is. For yeah. sure, he's more of like a. I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean towards him, but he sounds more of a uh, more of like an MMA disease than anything. <laughs> 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 And Dylan, we just want you to fight, man. Yeah, we just want you to fight. Just get in the cage again. Please, you don't need to do this stuff. If you really mm-hmm. want to make your name known, get in the cage. That way you can be more than just Conor McGregor's former teammate. Get in the cage and then proceed to get knocked out by a 72 24-year-old. <laughs> Which is probably what we need to be happening. Oh my god. No, no, no. No one no one what could happen. You know, maybe maybe Bellator will go the Michael Venom Page route where they get a guy who also shadows as a uh, Uber driver. <laughs> oh, it would be it would be the most Bellator to think of all time. But anyway though, yeah, I, I really don't care about this news at all. It's just it's just another day in the life of the DS brothers, I guess. You know what else I don't care about, Zan? I don't have a graphic for it, but I don't care about Floyd Mayweather versus Deji being an absolute disgrace to boxing. No, I don't either. And uh, and uh, and if you and if you paid money for that, I feel I feel sorry for you. <laughs> if you get if you paid money for that, you got what you paid for. Uh, Zan, I want to take a moment before we get into the big part of. I mean, we already had a big part of today's episode. Before we do go into the preview part of this episode, I do want to acknowledge the passing of Anthony Rumble Johnson, UFC, you know, former UFC light heavyweight contender, two-time title challenger, 
one of the most devastating knockout artists in the in the weight class. UFC veteran, Bellator veteran, passing away at just 38. Non uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, unfortunately, taking his life very young. Um, Zan, we actually, if you remember, he was competing in the Bellator light heavyweight Grand Prix, got out of the first round, but was forced out of his semifinal bout due to illness and. We saw a couple of scary posts about making it into 2022. And unfortunately, it seems like Rumble Johnson's long battle with illness comes to an end with his passing. Yeah, um, this was the most shocking MMA news of the weekend. Uh, As we spoke about off air, I couldn't believe it when this news broke. Um, I mean, I've been watching Anthony Rumble Johnson since 2008. And... um, You know, just his career was just so unique in so many ways. He had just this thunderous power, and he was between, like, three different weight divisions. And, you know, he had all the weight issues at 185 and all that, and then he had a career resurgence at white heavyweight. And we never got to see, you know, what would have been one of the most stylistically intriguing matchups of all time, in my opinion, in 2015, when he was set to fight John Jones and it's just really unfortunate that we never got a chance to see like, you know, rumble at his full potential fighting one of the best in the world. But, you know, you just always knew when Anthony Johnson was going to fight, who just knew that it was going to be all action packed and he was going to go in there and give it everything he had. And, you know, he was just one of those guys where, you know, it was just a joy to watch him fight because you didn't know like, you know, how he was going to look or what he was going to do or what his next part of the story was going to be. And I just feel like the MMA community lost one of the most entertaining fighters of his era and will be solely missed both on the UFC side and on the Bellator side. And we can only speculate now how that Grand Prix would have turned out if he was able to physically and mentally stay in it because um, he was looking like he was going to change the entire organization to that point. And it's just unfortunate that, you know, Hodgkin's when Foma got to him and it's just a really, a really tough loss for the MMA community at large. So Zen, five of his last seven UFC fights, he had a performance of the night bonus. The only t- two times where he didn't, it was the two times he fought Cormier for the uh for the light heavyweight title. But I mean, you just think about his sub-minute knockout of uh, Rogerio Nogueira, his first-round knockout of Alexander Gustafson, his fir- his second-round knockout of Jimmy Manoa. I think, though, Zan, the highlight will always be, to me, that first-round 13-second knockout of Glover Teixeira in the co-main event of UFC 202. Yeah, and two knockouts you didn't mention, uh, his fight with Tommy Spear and his fight with... Um, 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 and this fight with um, Yoshiki Yoshida, UFC 104, where he knocked him out very, very quickly. Uh, yeah, Zen, just absolutely unbelievable that, you know, this guy went from welterweight to middleweight and then having fights at light heavyweight and heavyweight. Obviously, he had the weight issues early. He ends up go- – he had, he had the weight issues when it came to light uh, – to welterweight got moved up to the middleweight division, missed weight for that fight, and then got easily, I think, subbed by Vitor Belfort, led to him getting released, that he had to rebound his career with uh, organizations like Titan and the World Series of Fighting, the you know current-day professional fighters league. Um, but he rebounded pretty well, and he just he was a j- powerful jack dude. It's amazing how you know quickly he went – uh, you know, from being a welterweight fighter, being pretty good there, pretty decent there, to being unbelievable as a fighter at light heavyweight. You mentioned the fight with John Jones, and that's definitely one of those fights that got away. Although we will always have that press conference moment in which he and Jones pretended to brawl with one another and panic Dana White, and then just they completely, you know, shook hands and hugged just just to mess with Dana a little bit. Not just to panic Dana, but nearly scare the shit out of him and give him a heart attack. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, that that was that was fantastic. 
Um, and it also capped off one of the weirdest fan Q and A's of all time, too. <laughs> and now they know the end of John Jones's first run as light heavyweight champion is just a a whole like a you whole said saga. An entire yeah. saga. <laughs> um I I felt pretty sad after UFC 210 because it didn't feel like that it was his full potential in that fight, and then just to shockingly announce retirement. I was glad we were able to see him now, you know, especially now knowing of his passing that we were able to see him at least one more time when he fought uh, Jose Azevedo in the Bellator Grand Prix and scoring, you know, a classic Rumble Johnson knockout. Not just a classic Rumble Johnson knockout, but a classic Rumble Johnson comeback, I might add. It's a crazy fight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm going to miss that man. Absolutely. You know, guy, hell of a competitor in the cage. Absolutely. All right. All right, Sam. Let's talk about the big news. For the first time, ladies and gentlemen, the MMA Outsiders will be on site. We will be on site for what? Well, for Bellator 288. Because it happens to take place in Chicago, and one of us two are, is actually from Chicago. Yeah. So thankfully, I've been um, afforded the opportunity to go cover. My first MMA event as a member of the media, and it happens to be one of the biggest Bellator cards in UFC has, or excuse me, one of the biggest Bellator cards in recent memory. (laughs) You're one of the best Bellator cards in UFC history. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, to be fair, Dana has been more introducing Bellator into their lore when when they reference Michael Chandler. That is that is true. Oh, I, I apologize for the near blooper, but we have a we have a solid lineup of fights. We're gonna finally have some closure with the Vadim Nemkov Corey Anderson saga. We think we we think. we think we think. Well, thankfully, the good news for Corey Anderson is he has Chicago roots. The a, the fight is in his hometown. There's gonna be a lot of Corey Anderson supporters there. I uh, don't be surprised if Corey Anderson. And uh, gets this fight done, or and wins and wins the fight in front of his home crowd. Um, I will because I'll say this: I'll make predictions for these fights, but because uh, it will be, I will, will be covering them on site. My breakdowns won't be as extensive as they usually, or just because I'm actually going to be there. But I will say that this fight is your is your classic matchup. I mean, you have Corey Anderson, who's been a stud has been around the sport for a long time versus Vadim Nemkov or to the casual fan. I would say, hey, Tom, he's not really as well known, but he is a, he's a solid champion. He's in some big fights and he's, and um, I mean, he represents Bellator well as a guy who I would say doesn't talk very much. And I would say does most of his talking in the cage I think it's absurd that he's a slight underdog. What do you what do you think? I think the reason the odds have him as a slight underdog is because of how that first fight played out. Because then if Corey Anderson doesn't open his mouth and say anything to the ref about the headbutt, Corey Anderson's walking out of there a million dollar champion. And I think, you know, I it's kind of that fear, you know. Did Corey Anderson talk himself out? talk himself out of a championship and million dollars. You know, honesty is the best policy, but in this case, honesty may have just cost him a million dollars in the title if he can't replicate that same performance this weekend. And Vadim Nemkov, I mean, excellent fighter, great power, great wrestling, trained Zan. They always make mention of this with Bellator when Vadim Nemkov fights. Trained by who? The one and only Fedor Emelianenko. Very true. And Vader Emelianenko has been a uh, has been a legend of the sport for for years, and has been one of the Bellator staples um, of late. And um, yeah, I mean, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see uh, to see how this fight plays out. I gotta say that if Vadim Nemkov fights the way he did, Felipe wins. It might be a short night uh, for Gordy Anderson, although. Corey Anderson did shock the world when he knocked out Ryan Bader. So I really do feel like someone is getting viciously finished in this fight. Someone's going to get viciously finished. And in fact, Zan, 
in terms of a in terms of a best bet, I will bring up the best bet uh, thing early. I would say Zan, I would bet the under under halfway point in this one. I would go under two and a half rounds. That that's that's an interesting pick. Um, yeah, I, I, I see I see second second round early third. This one gets done. I really like that. I just like that it won't go the distance. That's what I would. That's what I, I that, would that would probably be a safer bet. Probably don't go to distance. Um, in terms of who, here's how I'm just going to analyze it. If Corey Anderson can bring the same level of ex, level of fighting that he brought against Vadim Nemkov, then Corey Anderson could certainly get this job done. If Nemkov comes comes out and is able to get Corey Anderson off his game early. It's going to be Nemkov's night. I don't I know, Zan. Let me because here's the I thing. I see that happening too. I, I I want to lean towards Anderson, but a minus two forty. I, I don't know if I would go that high. I would go maybe minus two hundred at most. Yeah, I would. So, it's a, in terms, you, don't, so in terms, you don't want to bet more than what you might win. So right. So in in terms of in terms of laying down money, it's strange. In terms of laying down money, I would want to lay my money more down on Nemkov, although even though I think Anderson might get the win here. I think Nemkov has value. If you if you get what I say, that's fair. I just don't think Corey Anderson loses in front of um, a lot of his home fans. He's from Rockton, Illinois, which is not Chicago, but you know it's he's still from the state. I I think a lot of supporters are going to be backing him, and I think he's going to have the crowd on his side. I yeah, do. yeah, yeah. I I think my pick actually, Zant, is going to be Corey Anderson by early third round finish. I think that's fair. My pick. Fair. I'm I, I'm, I'm just saying yeah. Nemkov. I'm just saying for your better. I'm just saying for the betters out there, Nemkov has some interesting value you might want to look at. That's also uh, uh, also not a solid take. That's also not not a bad take, I should say either. We now go uh, Bellator two eighty eight co main event lightweight title on the line, second title fight as Patricky Pitbull faces the challenge of the undefeated Usman Nurmagomedov. And Nurmagomedov, a minus four hundred heavy favorite. Very interesting. Uh, Pitbull's been around forever. Um, obviously has been, you know, a staple of the Bellator promotion for what I would say five or six years. When do you, when do you agree? Um, and I would, yeah. you know, I really, I really do think this is Usman Nurmagomedov's time. And I actually think we're going to, we're going to have, uh, we're going to have an end new at the end of the night. I, Zan, I mean, I would call minus 400 a little bit ridiculous and I would say flat out disrespectful to Patricky Pitbull calling him a, my, a plus 300 underdog. But, I mean, you look at the skills, you look at the fact that uh, Patricky Pitbull is 12 years Usman senior, you look at the fact that Usman Nurmagomedov is undefeated, and then, whether related or not, everyone seems to go nuts when the last name is Nurmagomedov at this point. True. So, very- I... I, I think I'm going to be in the boat with you. I think uh, Usman Nurmagomedov gets it done. Do you think this gets a finish? Um, before the fourth round, yes, I do. Hmm. Uh, I think Nurmagomedov I, I, wins in the third round. I I could see I could see a third round finish for Nurmagomedov as well. I I think we're on the same boat there. Hmm. All right, let's look at the non-title fights for uh, that have the uh, main card for Bellator 288. We've got a we've got Daniel Weichel, a former Bellator title challenger or champion. Former title challenger. Title challenger. Yeah, I was like, he never won the belt, right? So, but, but he's fought Zen. He's fought fifty-five times. This is his fifty-sixth professional fight. That's nuts. And he's taking on Timur Kaziriev, who. Who is a perfect 11 and 0 because there you have the minus 2 280 moderate favorite Sonic at the letter. If we're being honest, who, who is Chris? He have really fought though. That's the that's the thing. 
I, I this thing I like his I like his youth I like his skills but I think Weichel's got the uh, experience edge he's got the height edge and actually you look at Timur Timur Kuziev this is his this is his Bellator debut he's only fought in EFC and AMC we haven't really seen much of him, so I I can't really judge Timur completely until I've seen you know, a big, you know, big performance from him, but 55 fights for your first Bellator fight. You know, I, I, I feel like the experience edge, I'm going to give it to Michael. I would probably go by decision more as a safer bet than any sort of finish, but I would still go Michael by decision. Yeah. That's not a solid, that's not a solid, um, that's not a, uh, that's not a bad, um, prediction there as well. I was going to say, um, I was going to say two. Um, actually, this is interesting. Um, so I didn't know, I don't know if you know this, but in the Bellator rankings going into this weekend, um, Daniel, Daniel uh, Weichel was ranked number seven um, um, in his, in his division. Do you think that that's too high or do you think that that's too low? I mean, if you want to look at his recent records, Zen. I mean, he won against Robert Whiteford. He lost to Pedro Cavallo, Emmanuel Sanchez, lost to Goiti Amalucci and Patricio Pitbull. I mean, I mean that's going back to 2018. But regardless, I mean, Zan, he, he's lost to some big names, but the people he's been winning against haven't exactly been screaming, you know, title contenders. So... Maybe it's I just state position, seven, but I, I kind of think it's too high. Yeah, yeah, yeah so too high. I think we're in agreement. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was like, wait, that doesn't seem to make a ton of sense because I knew his resume hadn't been the greatest leading up to this fight. That's why I was confused. I'm like, wait, what? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it doesn't make sense to me. I would go Michael by decision. Uh, looking at the rest of the card, Tyrell Fortune taking on Daniel James. Uh, Zan. I actually got the opportunity to speak to Tyrell Fortune, and you can check that out on Fan Sided MMA's page. My little interview with Tyrell Fortune. Uh, let's see if maybe maybe I can make a card on here to link you guys, link you viewers over to that. Um, Tyrell Fortune and I talked. Tyrell Fortune, I think, is ranked number five right now at heavyweight for a Bellator, and he is you talking sure about yep. Zan how, yep. and he was talking about how Zan um. He just seems to not be able to get a fight with one of those top fighters. Obviously, he's not going to get a fight with, uh, with uh, I think he lost to Moldovsky. No, it was Linton Vassell he fought. He Oh, Tim Johnson was in 2020. So Tim Johnson, Linton Vassell. So he's going to get immediate rematches with either of those guys. But Moldovsky we talked about, and we talked about Czech Congo. And Zan, the point that Tyrell Fortune was making in that interview was that none of the top five seem to want to fight him. None of the top five seem to want to fight him and risk, you know, their ranking. But here's Tyrell Fortune. You know, Czech Congo could be available for a fight, and or he hasn't accepted any Fortune's challenges. So, I mean, if you're Bellator, and if Tyrell Fortune has a big performance against Daniel James, and Daniel James is uh, older... Let's see. He's a plus two forty underdog. He's eight years the elder of uh, Tyrell Fortune. That's fought, he fought one time in Bellator, way back in the day, in like twenty fourteen. He might have the four inch height advantage and five inch reach edge, but I would still go with Fortune by first round or early second round finish. And said, how much longer? You know, I mean, if what Fortune is saying is true, it's more on the guys ahead of him. How much longer can he be denied, though? Like, why is he? Why is the number five heavyweight fighting a guy like Daniel James, who hasn't fought in Bellator in eight years? Yeah, I mean, I think that I'll be honest. I really do think the only reason is so Bellator could say, "Oh, we have a couple Chicago guys on the card." That that's literally that's literally the only reason. Oh, is that that reminds me? That reminds me. He had a phenomenal response. I said, you know, Daniel James is competing in Chicago. You know, he's from Chicago. Are you going to have fun with the crowd and get food? And Tyrell Fortune is just like, man, it's Chicago. 
I'm not going to play with the crowd. I'm just going to, you know, do my thing. You know, I don't care. And he basically said, I'm not going to go get hurt. I'm not going to, you know, mock the crowd and get hurt afterward. Interesting. It's just uh, crazy to me that Daniel James hasn't fought in Bellator in eight years. And this is the guy who is coming back to fight. That is, that is crazy to me. Do, do you smell, do you smell first round knockout? For title of fortune? Yes, I do. All right, I'm, and, talking a, gonna, I'm talking a nasty first round knockout too. It's gonna be it's gonna be bad. It's gonna either be by a flying knee or a, or an overhand right, in my opinion. I could definitely see him landing one of those overhand rights and just putting Daniel James in another atmosphere. Uh one last one on the main card to talk about: Roman Ferra, Feraldo versus Levon Kelly. Your thoughts on this end? Yeah, this is another solid fight. I think this to be an all-out stand-up war. I actually see this fight going to a decision. What do you What do you think? I would say decision. I think Roman keeps his undefeated streak. I do too. Although, wouldn't you agree that um, Joe Kelly has the advantage as the advantage in the wrestling department, though? Yeah, he does have the advantage in the wrestling, but if he keeps the fight, if this fight stays standing, like you kind of implied that it is a stand up war, I think Roman has an edge. I think it depends on how this fight, you know, where this fight is dictated. If it's solely on the feet, it's going to be Roman. If uh, can, if Chokelli can keep, get this fight to the ground on multiple occasions, then he will have the edge. Either way, this goes to decision, and I'll probably lean to Roman on this one. This is, uh, this is a fight of the night candidate, in my opinion. This is an underrated one. It's certainly an underrated fight. Uh, speaking of underrated, Zen, we do have a couple of you. I, even though you're going to be at Bellator the previous day, we do have a couple of uh, card fights looked at for the U.S. We have an interesting interesting card. Maybe not the most exciting one of those. You know, we're coming off of MSG, coming off a hot crowd. Uh, main event, however, we got Derek the Black Beast Lewis taking on Sergey Spivak. And things have just not been the same for Derek Lewis. He's lost three of his last five. Yeah, no, they haven't. And um, this is a must-win territory for Derek Lewis. And uh, he seems to be the apex king as of late. So I'm going to take him to knock out Spivak before, before, the, um, before the fourth round. I think he actually wins in the second round. I think this is one of those cases where, you know, oh, my God, look at that. Look at that topology predictions. Look how that close is, that is. That's absurd. <laughs> that's absurd. To uh, I, I I guess Vivak might have some sort of edge because he has won four of his last five. He's 27 compared to Lewis's 37. But, yeah, what have we talked about with Lewis then? All, you need, all Lewis needs to do is land one punch. All he needs to do is blast you with one shot, one magical shot, and Spivak's lights could go out. I could see second round finish, if not early third. I could see it too. I could see it easily happening. But yeah, I, I got I got Lewis. And as a reminder, early start, 1 p.m. Eastern main card for those of you guys who are not uh, uh, on Pacific attention. Pacific time. Oh, 1 p.m. Pacific, Pacific time. That's a Pacific time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So sorry. So, so it's 4 a 4 p.m. PM. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. All right. All right. Um, I got. I got. I got Kudalaba here. It's a must-win spot for him. Kenny and Joku's a tough out, but I just feel like Kudalaba's power is going to be way too much, and he's going to find a home for a hook, and he's going to knock him and Joku out. <laughs> that's what I. That's what I think. Yeah, Hulk needs to land a big hook. Uh, I know Kennedy, I know, is, you know, somebody to, I know Kennedy has been in some, you know, an infamous fight or two with the UFC already, but Kutilava's got the experience. Kutilava has that Hulk style power. I can't go against Kutilava on this one. I say Kutilava first or second round finish. Solid prediction. All right. Solid. So I think. Yeah, I think it is. Uh, I can already tell the lag is getting. So let's end things here. Uh, I'm going to say thank you to everybody 
for tuning in to episode number 15 of the MMA Outsiders. As we said at the start of the show, make sure to hit that like button, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you get everything for the MMA Outsiders. Empty the bench, beyond the bench, game on, fruity cereal. Uh, Five more minutes, mom, the newest show to the network. So much more. Make sure to follow us across social media at, at MMA Outsiders ETB, especially this weekend when Zan, you are there on Friday night for Bellator 288. Of course, yes, make sure please, to please do, especially especially this weekend. Very very well said. Mm-hmm. Make sure to follow the network at ETB Network. Make sure to follow Zan himself at Zanbando 99. Myself at Thomas J Albano and Tom Talk Sports Nine. You can find more of Zan's work over at BJPen.com, and he will have some of his work there as well this weekend. Find my stuff at Fansided MMA. I'll probably be doing a couple of recaps for the big Bellator card this weekend, as well as the UFC, probably the main event or, or co-main event. And, yeah, we got a lot of exciting stuff. So stay tuned later this week for some exclusive content as a first here for the MMA Outsiders with Bellator 288. And, Zan... Any last thoughts you want to say before uh, before this big weekend? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm very much looking forward to this. For those of you guys who have followed me for a while, me going to one MMA event a year is nothing new. However, this time I'm taking my fan hat off and I'm putting on my media hat. So it'll be definitely – it'll definitely be interesting watching everything with a bit of an impartial view, even though there is one in fight where I'd like to side towards one, one fighter – over another, I'm not going to reveal um, who that is or what that is until closer to the fight itself. But I'm very much looking forward to the event. Uh, Windrust is going to be rocking. And, um, you know, this is good for Bellator. They're closing out the year with a bang. And this is, you know, another card before the end of the year that they've been trying to build up for a while. Actually, Patricky Pitbull made an appearance at the Bears game yesterday. Okay, so I think there's more, or, uh, or, or Sunday rather. And I think there's uh, more palpable buzz um, than 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 what than what there has been. So Bellator has been trying to push it. I've seen a lot more radio and TV um, advertisements to get people to buy tickets. So Bellator is taking this very seriously. And uh, when 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 fights come back right to Chicago, people are interested. People are into it, and uh, I think it's going to deliver Friday night. And I can hardly wait to be there. I'm already counting down the days. The first the First prelim is super early. It's at 5 p.m. and I can I can hardly wait. So 5 p.m. Central, right? Correct. Okay. IPM p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Eastern. It'll be on Pluto, Bellator's YouTube channel, and Showtime Sports' YouTube channel. And then you can jump over to literal Showtime on television. That is at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific for the main card. So I can't wait, Sam. I hope you have a good time. Hopefully we're pumping out some good content later this week. And yeah, thank you all for tuning in. And this has been episode 15 of the MMA Outsiders. And always remember, whether it's Bellator, whether it's whether it's UFC, whether we're live and there in person, or whether we're just, you know, chilling at home, always, always be Joe Piper. Be Joe Piper. Thank you again for listening, everyone. We'll see you next week, everybody. Well, later this week, too. But we'll see you for a new episode next week. For real.